Okay, uh, here's chapter 14 of Barnaby Brockett, which is photographed in the newspaper. The following morning, Barnaby found himself back at Penn Station. Standing on the terminal concourse, he glanced down at his feet where a pattern of red and white lines panned across the floor, in sharp detail where he stood, but fading a little to the left and right. He craned his neck and looked up at the windows behind him, where the morning sunlight was pouring through the base of the enormous Stars and Stripes flag, sending their colours floating down like a patriotic wave. The station was filled with commuters, bleary-eyed and wet-haired in the morning rush hour, all carrying coffee in one hand and doughnuts in the other. From their expressions, you would have thought that if they failed to get to where they were going immediately, or preferably sooner, then the entire universe would come to an end. They were that busy and that important. Barnaby took a deep breath, then exhaled loudly as he watched the tourists milling around an information booth, arguing with the exhausted looking woman trapped inside. On his back, he was carrying a brand new rucksack filled with old pieces of heavy iron from the basement of the Chrysler building, which stopped him rising off the ground and finding himself trapped under the concourse roof. Morning, Barnaby, said Charles Etheridge, marching towards him purposefully, carrying two bottles of water and a couple of apples. No coffee or cakes for him. Some of the people making their way in and out of the station stared at the terrible burn marks that covered his face and looked away. Their cruel expressions might have hurt Charles's feelings had he not grown accustomed to being stared at. A teenage girl made a gagging sound, pointing a finger towards the centre of her open mouth, and her friend burst out laughing. Her screech made him look at her, and she flushed scarlet before turning away. She and her friend ran down the steps in fits of laughter. I brought you some breakfast, said Charles, his voice betraying a wounded awareness of what had just taken place. I thought you might be hungry. Thanks, said Barnaby. And I collected our tickets on the way, he added, waving a couple of pieces of paper in the air. We'd better hurry if we're going to make it in time. They headed downstairs and zigzagged through a series of long corridors that led to platforms. You heard that young Mr. Pruitt sold all of his pieces last night, I suppose, asked Charles. And for, and for a very tidy sum too. The New Yorker is running a major feature on the exhibition next week and the New York Times is already preparing its list of reasons why it isn't as good as everyone says it is. He's the toast of the town and it's all down to you. I'm just glad he's going to be an artist after all, said Barnaby, and that he's made up with his family. He was always an artist, replied Charles. He's just going to be a very rich one. And in my experience, the two don't always go hand in hand. They made their way to platform nine, where their train was waiting, and Barnaby looked across at the space that separated it from platform ten and narrowed his eyes. Wrong station, said Charles, noticing what the boy was doing. Just checking, said Barnaby, smiling as they boarded the train. Looking at the seats, he was pleased to see that he could stop himself from floating to the ceiling simply by buckling his seatbelt around his waist, while Charles placed his rucksack on one of the overhead storage racks. That must get very awkward, said Charles. The whole floating business, I mean. There must be so much you can't do. I suppose so, said Bar replied Barnaby, as the whistle blew and the train began to pull out of the station. Only I've never known anything different. Although there was this one time when I was climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge with my class and we were all tied to the side in a long line. And for the first time in my life, I was exactly the same as everyone else. And how did that feel? Weird, said Barnaby, pulling a face. I didn't feel like myself at all. I didn't like it. Charles nodded and stared at him for a moment, a half smile on his face before laughing a little and opening his newspaper to scan the headlines. Barnaby looked out of the window and watched the scenery move past at high speed. He wished he'd brought a book with him. A little Diartagne would go down well for a very very well on a journey like this there were a few hours in they were a few hours into their journey when the train pulled into albany where a group of passengers got off and a lot more got on barnaby watched as a handsome young man threw an enormous green haversack onto the overhead rack and sat in the seat in front his nose was buried in a book and barnaby peered over to see the title a nation of politicians <laughs>
You don't have any adventure stories in that bag, I suppose, asked Barnaby, leading fo leaning forward, hopefully. The young man turned round in surprise. I don't, I'm afraid, he said. I'm a history man, but I can give you something on land re reform in early 19th century Ireland, if you're interested. Barnaby sighed and shook his head. He was in the mood for something with a chase in it. Or an orphan trying to make his own way in the world. Or a bit of fighting. The carriage was quite busy by now, but there was a pair of free seats across the aisle and a mother and daughter came towards them, hurrying to claim them. A relieved expression spread across the woman's face when she realised that she was not going to be standing in the aisle for the next 300 miles. However, as they got closer, the little girl stopped in her tracks, took one look at the burns on Charles's face and refused to move. Instead, her mouth dropped open. She stood stock still and looked as if she wasn't sure whether to scream or simply faint away. Move it, Betty Ann, snapped the woman, noticing Charles too and shooting him an irritated look as if it was inconsiderate of him to sit in a railway carriage when he looked like that. Betty Ann, I said, move it. Still, the little girl refused to take her seat. Will you do as you're told, please, insisted the woman. And this time she pushed her daughter forward, forcing her into the window seat while she took the aisle with nothing more than the narrow corridors separating her from Charles. Barnaby watched all this with great interest and then turned to look at his companion, who was busy reading an article, even though Barnaby was sure that he had seen him reading that very same page thoroughly about 30 minutes earlier. Of course, when Barnaby had first met Charles the night before, he had been taken aback by the dark red scars and wrinkled skin that spread across his face from just below his right eye to the left-hand side of his chin. One of his ears looked rather gristly too, and there was a patch of clear white skin above his right eyebrow that appeared completely smooth. And even though he knew it was rude, he kept staring until Charles eventually put down the newspaper and turned to look at him. What? he asked. Nothing, said Barnaby, flushing slightly and turning to stare out of the window again. You were looking at my face. Barnaby glanced back and bit his lip. I just, he began, well, I wondered what happened to you, that's all. Do you mind me asking? No, I don't mind, said Charles, folding the paper in half. To be honest, I'd rather you asked me straight out than just stared at me as if I was an animal in the zoo. He raised his voice a little for the benefit of Betty Ann and her mum, who ignored him completely. By now, the child was locked into a computer game and the mother was reading about celebrities. And it's interesting that you ask now because I just noticed this. He unfolded the paper and showed Barnaby a photograph in a style section of a very beautiful young woman on a catwalk at a fashion show. Everyone in the audience was watching her expression with expressions such as mortals might have shown in ancient times when the gods descended to wander in their company. But the model simply stared down the lens of the camera with a look of bored disinterest on her face. Do you see this woman? asked Charles and Barnaby nodded. You recognise her, I suppose? No, said Barnaby, shaking his head. Really? You'd be about the only person in this carriage who doesn't. You've heard her name, surely. Eva Etheridge? Barnaby shrugged his shoulders, wondering whether he should just pretend. Is she a model? He asked. Is she a model? asked Charles, laughing. She's only one of the most famous models in the world. She's been the face of so many campaigns that she's that even she's probably forgotten half of them. Not that she'd think of herself as just a model, of course. She's a singer too, an actress, a television personality. She has an underwear range designed sp specifically for other malnourished women. She's a spokesperson for any number of beauty products. He hesitated for a moment and shook his head, smiling a little. Oh, and she's my sister, he added. I almost forgot that. Barnaby lifted the newspaper off Charles's lap and took another look, trying to see whether she bore any resemblance to the man seated beside him. But it was impossible to make out what he truly looked like beneath all those terrible scars. And these two people here, continued Charles, turning the page to a gallery of smaller photographs from the same fashion show. These are my parents, Edward and Edwardine, Edwardine Etheridge. He's an extremely famous designer and she's an equally successful photographer. But this show was on last night, said Barnaby, pointing at the date on the top of the page. That's right. And yet you went to Joshua's exhibition rather than that. 
Of course I did. Didn't they invite you? Oh, they invited me, all right, said Charles, his laugh a rather bitter one. They always invite me to things now, ever since I became a famous art critic, but I never go. Why not? asked Barnaby, frowning. There was a time when I needed them very badly and they weren't there for me, Charles replied, his tone filled with sorrow now. They weren't interested in me at all until I was somebody. Now it just seems like too little too late. But they're your family, said Barnaby. And look what your family did to you, said Charles, who had heard the story of the terrible thing that happened at Mrs Macquarie's chair from both Vincent and Joshua Pruitt the night before. You asked how I got my scars, he added, rubbing his eyes and sighing. Are you sure you want to know? If you don't mind telling me, said Barnaby, who, who did want to know. I don't mind telling you, said Charles, but it's not a happy story and it doesn't have a happy ending. Most stories don't, said Barnaby. I don't know how mine is going to turn out yet, but I'd like to hear yours. And we'll have to hear his story another time, because that is the end of that chapter. So we'll find out how he got the scars on his face next time.